Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Today's Cancer Care virtual seminar topic is metastatic prostate cancer to bone. My name is Annie Gebby. I'm an outreach coordinator for the Samaritan Cancer Resource Center, and I will be your host and moderator today. This event is brought to you by the Samaritan Cancer Resource Center. We partner with anyone touched by cancer to provide the support they need to live with strength, determination, and hope into the future. Joining us today is Dr. Nicholas Tedesco. Dr. Tedesco is an orthopedic oncologist with Samaritan Medical Group, and we're so glad that he's here with us today to talk about this very important topic. And I will go ahead and turn the presentation over to you, Dr. T. All right. Well, thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Nicholas Tedesco. I'm an orthopedic oncologist and complex reconstruction specialist here with Good Samaritan, um, basically centered in Corvallis at Good Samaritan Regional. Um, and work with the Pastega Cancer Center here as well. And so today we are going to talk about metastatic prostate cancer, specifically metastatic prostate cancer to bone. So what we'll go over is what exactly is prostate cancer, um, how does it spread, and what happens when it does. We're also gonna talk about what exactly is orthopedic oncology and what I do. So what's its history and what are we doing here in Corvallis in terms of metastatic prostate cancer when it involves the bone. So we'll start off with prostate cancer specifically. So there are several different types of prostate cancer, but by far and away the most commonly diagnosed is something called prostate adenocarcinoma, which is basically a cancer of the glandular portion of the prostate. The prostate is a gland that surrounds the urethra just below the urinary bladder and sits just in front of the rectum. Um, it is involved in producing fluid that keeps sperm nourished, uh, but as you can see in the picture on the right here, in the wrong type of environment, cells start to divide and become cancerous, and then they're a big problem. This is the most common cancer in men. In fact, one in eight men in the United States, in the United States will be diagnosed in their lifetime at some point. We tend to think of this as an older aged adult type of cancer, but about 60% are diagnosed after age 65, which means 40% are diagnosed before that. There are about 250,000 new cases per year in the entire United States, um, and it accounts for about 35,000 deaths per year. About one in 40 men will die of prostate cancer in this country. About 3.1 million men are currently living with prostate cancer in the United States. So it is a huge disease burden when you think about that on a population level. Survival five years from diagnosis completely depends on when we find it and how we find it. So if we find it and it's still confined to the prostate alone and has not spread anywhere else other than maybe one or two local lymph nodes, Five-year survival is almost 100%, which means we can beat it and we can cure it in those patients. However, if it has already spread to other areas, such as bone, farther lymph nodes, the lung, or uh, liver, any other organs, basically five-year survival drops from 100% to 30%. So only three out of 10 patients diagnosed at that stage will still be alive in five years. So once again, when we talk about metastatic or metastatic disease, that means it is spread far away from the, the prostate itself, and that obviously is a bad prognostic indicator for us. So metastatic prostate cancer is the actual cancerous cells of themselves that have spread beyond the prostate. Most commonly, they go to lymph nodes, followed by the lungs, followed by bone, followed by liver, but really they can show up anywhere depending on the disease process and how far along in it we are. Specifically, what we're gonna to talk today about is bone. So by definition, once prostate cancer has spread to bone, this is what we call stage four cancer. So whenever we stage any cancer, we talk about stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four that are basically meant to be prognostic indicators, which means those that are diagnosed in stage one do much better and have a much better survival than those diagnosed in stage four with stage two and three being intermediate. The importance of that is knowing what stage we're in helps us drive our treatments and figure out what might be best for a, a specific patient. About 80% of patients who experience stage four metastatic prostate cancer will have it spread to bone. 
it tends to start centrally and then spreading peripherally. So it's very rare to find a metastatic prostate cancer in the humerus and nowhere else. Usually instead, it, it starts in the spine and then goes to the ribs, the pelvis and the shoulder blade before it ends up in the extremities. And again, the extremities closer to the, the center, like the upper end of the humerus and femur. And then finally, it ends up very distal below the elbow or below the knee. Survival one year after metastatic spread. So in all comers, when we look at um, all metastatic prostate cancer that is spread beyond the prostate gland, we know that if no bone is involved with that, so it's only spread to the lung or maybe to lymph nodes or wherever else, their survival in one year is about 90%. So nine out of 10 patients will survive more than a year. But if the bone is involved, that number drops to only five out of 10. So again, once bone is involved with prostate cancer, that tends to be a, a pretty bad sign. And that means we need to jump on this and get as aggressive as we can. Metastatic prostate cancer has lots of different treatment algorithms, and these exist based on the patient age, their general health, as well as the stage of disease, as we talked about before. But really, it requires a panel of experts in multidisciplinary care to figure it out, because depending on all of these, as well as patient goals and desires and genetics and all kinds of other things, we may treat every single person's individual cancer very, very differently. And you can see here that in the kind of patient-centered care model, there's all of these different multidisciplinary specialties that are required to get a patient safely and effectively through management of this particular disease. And so all of those red lines are how the patient interacts with those specific subspecialties, but all the blue lines are how we're all communicating with each other in the background trying to figure out the best treatment and the best timing of that treatment. So who comes first? Orthopedic oncology, medical oncology, radiation oncology, palliative care, interventional radiology. And so we're trying to figure that out on the back end all the time. We actually have uh, several multidisciplinary care conferences where we discuss difficult cases um, every week and try and figure out what's gonna be optimal for each individual patient to try and improve outcomes and survival. So in terms of management of the metastatic prostate cancer, chemotherapy remains a mainstay for that and quite often something called chemical castration. What chemical castration is, is basically some sort of medicine that's designed to inhibit testosterone because testosterone tends to drive these tumors and increase their growth. If we can block the testosterone, hopefully we block their growth and further spread. In addition to that, especially once it ends up in the bone, we typically have to treat these with what's called bone stabilizing agents, which are common things like alendronate or zomata or reclast or you know, um, prolia, any of these drugs that you've seen advertised on TV or that you may have experience with if you've known someone or are someone battling with or who has survived prostate cancer. What all of those drugs are designed to do is to try and stabilize the bone to prevent bone loss. So as the tumor starts to grow in bone, it wants to take over the bone and it induces basically the bone to recede in its pathway. And so what those try to do is defend against that. Why that's important is because as tumor starts to infiltrate bone, the bone weakens and then it can very easily fracture with little to no energy at all. And so those are one more piece of armamentarium to try and keep the strength of bones up and prevent a major fracture or joint problem as a result of tumor spread. So that's where I come in as an orthopedic oncologist. So historically, patients would have to travel very long distances to find an orthopedic oncology specialist. Uh, but most cases were easily managed by a local community orthopedic surgeon, again, depending on the stage and what's going on with the patient. However, now with a lot of our improved chemotherapy mechanisms and treatments, as well as early detection, patients are living a lot longer and with more advanced stages of prostate cancer, which presents new challenges requiring more advanced expertise. So now more than ever, my specialty is needed in the management of metastatic prostate cancer to bone. I've been servicing the southern half of Oregon since 2016. I'm one of only five orthopedic oncologists in the state and the only one outside of Portland. I'm the only one between Portland and Sacramento. So 
there's only about 125 total orthopedic oncologists in the entire United States. And that doesn't seem like a whole lot, but you're also talking about managing some very rare diseases or rare presentations of diseases. So believe it or not, we actually have the, the uh, population pretty well covered with what we have. But again, our demand is going up because these tumors are, are living in patients for longer and becoming more structurally problematic with time. So what are we doing here at Good Samaritan and what kind of national presence do we have? So even in you know, Corvallis, which is not a major metropolitan area, we do serve as a huge regional center that captures a lot of Southern Oregon and especially the Southern half of the Willamette Valley. So what do we do here? Well, our medical oncologists participate in multiple clinical trials involved with several different types of cancer. We do keep track of patients with a local database and case repository so that we can monitor these things and study them over time in order to try and figure out risk factors or prevent adverse outcomes or improve survival or get more answers on the optimal management and timing of all of this stuff. We do have plans to contribute starting either this year or early next year to a national sarcoma database that will also include metastatic carcinoma uh, cases that are treated surgically. So once we can be part of that, we will also have access to all of that data. And once we start finally collecting data nationwide on this, we'll have so many cases that hopefully that will really spur a lot of new research and, and better technological advances to help manage all of this stuff. Additionally, I serve on the Evidence-Based Medicine Committee nationally with the Musculoskeletal Tumor Society, which basically is tasked with finding clinical practice guidelines and what's called appropriate use criteria methodology to figure out what is the optimal management and treatment of many different types of cancers that ultimately involve the musculoskeletal system. I also sit on the board of the directors for the Musculoskeletal Oncology Research Initiative, which is a nationwide consortium of smaller centers like our own that aren't major academic centers that are involved in research, uh, trying to pool our resources as a collective to function as one large maybe university center. This has grown significantly since Maury was first started in 2014 and there are actually some big centers now that are part of it and now we have access to their databases and to their help with some of these research initiatives. We also have a residency program that changed the next generation of orthopedic surgeons. We just had our first resident go into orthopedic oncology, graduate in June of this year, and we have another one in training that that's what he plans on doing uh, when he graduates in a couple of years. So again, we're, we're starting to create you know, a national presence here and be involved nationally to where we have a lot of the, the latest and greatest either um, ideas or technology that are out there either start here or we're part of it right off the bat. So now we'll get into more of the orthopedic oncology aspect of this. Sorry about that. So what orthopedic oncology encompasses is basically the surgical management of tumors of the trunk, buttocks, arms, and legs. Basically intra-abdominal or intra-thoracic we tend to stay out of, but everywhere else is where we operate. I usually tell patients I operate just about anywhere below the mandible. We tend to preferentially involve things that involve bone, nerves, or soft tissues. A lot of skin cancers and things like that may show up with us, especially if a large reconstruction is needed, if they're very locally invasive. Otherwise, a lot of dermatologists or general surgeons will manage those, but a lot of the deeper tumors are what come our way. We tend to manage both benign and malignant tumors, and the most common benign tumors that we see are lipomas, which are fatty soft tissue tumors, nerve sheath tumors, um, and what's called osteochondromas, which are these uh, little spiculated things that stick on as a child and they grow with us, so they get larger and become more painful. The most common malignancies that we see are sarcomas, which are malignancies of connective tissue in our body, such as bone and muscle and tendon. Uh, but more commonly, we see metastatic carcinoma, of which prostate cancer falls under. So most of the common cancers that you know of are carcinomas, so breast cancer, colon cancer, kidney cancer, throat cancer, lung cancer, all the uh, ones that we typically think of um, uh, fall under there, the category of carcinoma. And so when those spread to bone or to soft tissues of the extremities, that's where we come in as surgeons when they need to be addressed. 
Lymphoma of bone is another thing we commonly see, as well as multiple myeloma. We also manage a lot of tumor-like conditions, which are basically things that present that mimic tumors or that where tumor needs to be ruled out, but they're not actually tumors themselves. So complex infections, immune system reactive processes, and things called hemangiomas, which are collections of blood vessels, can show up, look, act, present like, and even on imaging, look like a tumor. And so we need to rule those out and rule out a more nefarious process when we make our diagnosis. Orthopedic oncology as a specialty began about in the mid to late 1970s, once chemotherapy for osteosarcoma and limb salvage surgery became an option. And we'll talk about limb salvage surgery in just a bit and what that really means. Uh, prior to that, we didn't really have good chemotherapy. We didn't understand a lot of these diseases. And basically, when a tumor showed up in the extremities that was malignant, you got an amputation, and, and that was it. And that was all we had to offer. And so that's why this wasn't much of a specialty. But in the 1970s, we started developing a lot more treatment options and a lot better understanding of surgery and better surgical technology to be able to finally be able to do some very different and unique things for a patient system. As we talked about before, there's less than 150 active in North America orthopedic oncologists and about 250 worldwide, most of those all trained here in the United States. The grandfathers of orthopedic oncology are these four guys here. And so Bill Enneking was at the University of Florida, Henry Mankin was at Harvard, Michael Simon was at University of Chicago, and Jeff Eckert was out in UCLA. And so once upon a time, when you had one of these problems that involved the bone or the muscular uh, you know, extremity, you'd be shipped all over the country to one of these guys to manage it because the, so little was known and their degree of expertise was, was so far down the rabbit hole, they were the only and so that's where it all started. And from there, they started training more and more guys to where we now have about 150 of us. So in terms of limb salvage surgery, what does that mean? Well, basically it means anything but an amputation. So with an amputation, of course, that addresses the tumor, but obviously that introduces lots of new problems like neuropathic pain, issues with prosthetic wear, um, you know, all kinds of problems. And, and certainly it's a functional game changer for the patient. So what limb salvage surgery is supposed to be is a, a means of saving and reconstructing the limb, but more than that, preserving a functional limb. And so when this came about, really that was because better technology was available for surgery to where we could replace or we could fix or reconstruct things in ways that we couldn't prior to the 1970s. Limb salvage surgery encompasses a, a whole slew of different types of surgeries, and these ra range from tumor removal alone, so just cutting the tumor out, closing it up, and walk walking away, to tumor removal with internal fixation, like supporting a bone with uh, plate and screws or bone grafting or cement or something like that. Then you can have tumor removal with soft tissue reconstruction. So now we're out in the soft tissues, we're not in the bone, we need to rebuild ligaments or tendons, or we need to cut out blood, major blood vessels. And so we have to do a bypass graft in order to, to reperfuse the, uh, the limb so that we can save it. So lots of plastic surgery things are done for this. And even some of those techniques we employ as, as orthopedic oncology surgeons, we do a lot of muscle advancements and transfers, especially when muscle has to be sacrificed along with the tumor. And then as we just talked about the vascular bypasses or you know, workarounds or things like that with the blood vessels when needed. It can also be tumor removal with bone reconstruction or replacement. So where this comes in is something called an intercalary procedure. So when you look at a long bone like the femur, for instance, you have the knee joint at the bottom, the hip joint at the top, and then a big long straight line in between that serves as attachment for a lot of our muscles. So what you do when there's a tumor in the bone in the middle of that, you can now remove that and reconstruct it with a large metal block that takes up the space of the bone or a large bone graft. And that way you allow the muscles to scar back down to that. You get to preserve the joint above and below that area and you don't have to do a major radical procedure or have to replace a joint with something artificial. 
But on the flip side of that is you can do tumor removal with artificial joint replacement, especially when it does involve one of the joints or one of the surfaces of the joints. Like if you do have something in the upper or lower end of the femur and not in the middle. It also encompasses management of failure of these reconstructions with revision surgery. So these are, are big time operations that alter a lot of anatomy as you can imagine. And so they're not perfect. They're not exactly what the patient was born with. And there are all kinds of complications that can arise from infection to structural to mechanical. And so when those break down, sometimes there is no other option. And now we're facing a secondary amputation. But part of limb salvage surgery is being able to salvage that and being able to convert that to a new type of reconstruction or revise the reconstruction or something like that in order to preserve that limb and preserve its function so that the patient can keep getting around and doing okay. So we're gonna talk about each of those individually as well as kind of some examples of those. So tumor removal alone involves just cutting out the tumor. And sometimes that's very simple. If you have a soft tissue lump right below the skin, pretty easy, cut open the skin, take the tumor out, close the skin. But sometimes it's a little bit more complex. So here was one where a patient had an isolated tumor in the pelvis. If you can see my cursor, this is the tumor right here and this is the hip joint right here. So we don't have much space to cut the bone without either getting into the tumor or getting into the hip joint, which would be a very functionally you know, problematic thing for this patient. So for this particular one, we can use something called navigation or augmented reality, where we use a CT scan of the patient, and during surgery, we have these infrared readers hooked up to a computer that has loaded that CT scan, and we can use a probe that has that infrared reader, and so the computer knows exactly where we are on that patient's pelvis. So I can map out on the bone exactly what needs to be cut in order to thread this needle and preserve the hip, as well as get a wide margin around that tumor to where we can safely remove this without a huge mutilating surgery like we would have done had we had to do this blindly. So there's been a lot of stuff that even with tumor removal alone, we can make surgery a little bit smaller, a little bit safer, and still just as effective. Internal fixation is usually employed when the tumor is involved with the bone, and so part of it needs to come out, but we've got a structural failure of the bone. So here's a patient that had prostate cancer that you can see um, right here, the bone comes down and then all of a sudden there's a step off. So there was a fracture that kind of came right across the bone here. And right here is the tumor cavity. So not only did they have the presence of the tumor, but they've now got a structural failure of the bone. So just like when you normally have a fracture of the humerus, we've got to fix it with plate and screws, but we've got to do something biologically about that tumor because if it continues to progress, it's gonna grow below the, the screws. Eventually, they're not gonna be fixed into anything and then all of this is gonna fail and then we're gonna have a huge disaster on our hands. So what we do is we go in there, we scoop out as much of the tumor as we can. Sometimes we burn or freeze the cavity to kill any remaining cells. Then we fill that with bone cement and that's what this is. So kind of like a dentist fills a cavity but on a much larger uh, scale and then we fix the fracture with the plate and screws and we use some of them into the cement so that they function as rebar to reinforce the cement as well. Sometimes we use these bone nails which are long nails that go inside the bone um, that we're able to do through what's called a minimally invasive approach where we only make a small poke hole in the skin. We use a live x-ray video camera so that we know exactly what we're doing, where our instruments are, where the bone is, and then we pass a big long rod down through the entire bone. So if you think of the bone, when you see this thick, whiter outer part, this is called the cortex, and then in here is this intermediate gray, this is the bone marrow, which doesn't have a whole lot of structural integrity to it. And so what you do is you utilize this almost like a paper towel tube, where all the strength is at the periphery and there's nothing in the middle. So what you do for a humerus, especially when the break is farther down, is you make a small incision up top, and then you use that x-ray video camera to guide that nail into the humerus, and then you slide it all the way down the middle, and then a couple of interlocking screws up here and down there so that it can't rotate or piston, and sometimes that can function very well, especially when the tumor itself doesn't need to be removed and you don't need direct exposure of it. Because there's always a chance of 
still tumor left behind here that could cause more problems, we usually back up surgery in the setting of metastatic prostate cancer with radiation. And that's because radiation is very effective for prostate cancer and can kill any remaining tumor cells in the bone so that finally the bone can heal and the patient can get on with their life. The next thing is what's called endoprosthetic reconstruction. So just like a prosthetic for an amputation, it basically means an artificial body part. Endo just means inside, so an inside artificial body part. These encompass things as we talked about before, like those intercalary replacements. And so that's this right here, where you had a lesion in the shaft of the bone, that gets cut out, we jump that gap with this big metal block, and we have these big long stems that go up and down the remaining bone that get cemented in so that they're anchored very well, but we can preserve the rest of that bone, we can preserve the joint below it and above it, and we don't have to sacrifice major meaningful anatomy in order to get this tumor out of there safely. The next thing are simple joint replacements. So this is an artificial hip, just a total hip replacement, the same thing that folks get for uh, bad arthritis in their hip. And so sometimes patients have tumors in the upper end of their femur or in the pelvis right where this goes. And so to get that tumor out, you have to either destabilize or remove part of the joint. So now you have to replace that. And so we do just a simple joint replacement at the same time as the tumor removal. Sometimes you need what's called these mega endoprosthetics, which are basically an endoprosthetic that replaces way more than just a joint. So you can see in this bottom right picture, we have a, a what's called a total femur replacement. So this is replacement of the entire femur bone with an artificial hip at the top and an artificial knee at the bottom. This is done in major advanced cases where you have tumor throughout the entire bone where none of it really can be spared any longer and you have to cut it all out. This is a big deal as you can imagine. And so as we replace more and more anatomy, the stakes get higher, the risks are higher, the outcomes are a little bit worse, but again, we can preserve the leg and we can give you some function. Finally, we have this newer thing called custom endoprosthetics. So with 3D printing, there are companies out there that can take a CT scan or an MRI of a patient, they can model that in three dimensions, and then they can predict exactly where you need to cut the bone in order to remove the tumor, and then use a 3D printer with titanium to make a new titanium artificial replacement of that particular portion of the bone. So if you look in this upper right segment, this is a standard hip replacement where you replace the cup in the pelvis, but here we've replaced the cup and a lot of the pelvis with all these weird fixation points because we were able to utilize that type of technology to be able to cut out a lot of the pelvis, but still rebuild this and still give the patient a hip joint without having to do a major high level amputation or something like that. So custom endoprosthetics have really opened the door to salvage almost any anatomy that's out there that's involving bone or joint. <clears throat> As we just talked about with endoprosthetic reconstruction, they are used to remove tumor, rebuild the bone, and provide structural support in order to reestablish joint services or bypass failed bone healing mechanisms. Sometimes patients have already had the disease metastasized to the bone, and maybe they've had it treated with radiation, and maybe even successfully to where the tumor has died. But the problem is, is sometimes there's collateral damage with radiation and part of the bone can die as well. So here was a ca case of a patient who had prostate cancer in bone, and it's hard to see, but you can see this one little defect right here in the hip joint and this blush of increased calcium around it as well. And so this was prostate cancer that was involving the hip joint, but a good part of the pelvis. So what we do for this one is we can sort of bypass the junky bone, we can get it out of there and we can still rebuild the hip because this was one that was successfully treated with radiation and the prostate cancer in the bone had died, but you had all these structural problems now and part of the bone had died as well, which is what this extra white is. Dead bone tends to preferentially calcify more because that's what the body does for dead tissue and so that's why it gets brighter white. And so what we did was we were able to rebuild the hip and put in this special type of implant that bypasses all that bad bone and gets fixation above it, through it, and beyond it. And that allows us to anchor this into better bone without having to do a major pelvic resection and reconstruction 
because again, remember that bone serves not only structural purposes and as our joint, it also establishes all of the attachment sites for our muscles. So you always want to preserve bone whenever you can, because as you replace bone, sure the, the muscle will scar back down to metal, but not quite as well. And so patients tend to be a little bit weaker and have more limbs. So this now allows us to salvage a little bit more of the patient's anatomy and bypass it with some of these more uh, you know, challenging cases. So what are the complications that can arise with some of these surgeries? Well, you pretty much name it. If you can come up with it, it has happened. So there are medical complications because some of these surgeries are huge. A total femur replacement, for instance, takes about six hours to do and usually requires several units of blood transfusion. So as you can imagine, that puts a lot of stress on the body and we can see a lot of medical complications with that. We can even see mortalities. And of course, you can have mechanical problems. So these pieces and parts can break, they can fail, they can debond from the bone, they can dislocate, the, you know, you name it, they can happen. Infection is another big time problem, especially in patients that are on chemotherapy or maybe immunosuppressed. So managing these can be challenging. The stakes are high, the risks are high, but hopefully the benefits are high. And that's why these surgeries occasionally are worth it or are necessary in order to preserve a patient's function and quality of life. But this is why informed consent is so careful with these particular cases, especially in the setting of like metastatic prostate cancer, where we know the patient's already in stage four. And as you could see before, that survival can be very poor with those patients. And so we're talking about potentially doing a massive surgery in a patient who may already be terminal that patient may determine that's not in their best interest. And so patient autonomy is big when it comes to deciding on, on how we manage their, their, their uh, cancer here. And that's again, one of our focuses with the patient-centered care is not only putting the patient at the center, but putting the patient's goals and desires and expectations at the center as well. And so their goals and their expectations play a huge role. You know, when we talk about these cases, we have to talk about, well, what does recovery really look like? What are those risks? What are the percentages? What happens if I do get one of these problems? And, and giving the patient every bit of anatomy, that, or, or I'm sorry, every bit of um, in, uh, knowledge they can have about what they're about to go through in order to make that decision for themselves and for their family. Age and life expectancy, as well as medical background, do play a role in our decision making as well. And so in other words, there really isn't an algorithm for managing these things when they end up in the bone. It all comes down to a combination of the structural and mechanical problems in the bone being created, the presence of the tumor, and then all of these other factors when we decide to perform one of these surgeries on a patient. So in conclusion, orthopedic oncology is but a small part of the multidisciplinary care for these complicated cases here at Good Samaritan. Bone support surgically and medically are mainstays of metastatic prostate cancer. So as we talked about before, those bone stabilizing agents as well as chemotherapy and testosterone inhibitors are a big part of this, but oftentimes we do need metal and we do need cement to reason reinforce that bone and fix any structural and mechanical failures that have occurred. Limb salvage surgery is a burgeoning area of clinical and technological advances with many options currently available. So we can almost tailor any case to um, any anatomic problem or any particular patient's desires or goals. Each of these cases though must be tailored to the specific patient. So there, the anatomic considerations, the stage of the cancer, the bone structure and proximity to joints, the goals of the patient, informed consent of the patient and the patient's expectations. But I don't wanna leave out the family too, because especially while the patient is going through all of this, the family often has a lot of burden on them. They're the ones driving them to all these, these appointments and to these places and, and financially these take a big hit. And so it's, it's talking about all of these and getting all of these resources available for the patient and their pocketbook and their families through our resource center at the uh, Cancer Institute so that we can you know, provide as little of an impact as possible on all of your lives during management of these sort of complex problems. So for further reading, if you are interested in any of these topics, here's just a couple of short uh, links here. One of them is to the Pastega Cancer Center here. Um, the other one is to um, 
the, the uh, National Cancer Center, and then the MSTS is the Musculoskeletal Tumor Society, which is sort of the overseeing governing body of orthopedic oncology. Um, and so that's who I'm, I'm a member of and, and sit on some of their committees. And so I know that was kind of quicker than the hour allotted, but I wanted to leave enough time for questions, you know, comments, um, and, and let, uh, let you folks, you know, weigh in on your thoughts. Thanks so much, Dr. Tedesco. This is Annie. I'm going to take over the controls one more time. Um, while everyone uh, is putting in their comments or questions, I'm just going to take a moment to go over a little bit of uh, information about the Resource Center. Up on the screen now, I have all of our contact information. Uh, if you want to obtain any information or resources about cancer or just have general questions about um, upcoming events or uh, would like to ask Dr. Tedesco a question later on when you think of it before bed, <laughs> you can reach us any of these ways by phone, our website, email is great, and we do have Facebook and Instagram now if you'd like to follow us there for updates. Um, we'd really appreciate it, uh, your engagement there. And upcoming events, we have uh, Dr. Tedesco with us again in October for metastatic breast cancer to bone, and then interval breast cancer in October as well, Monday, October 10th in Spanish, and Tuesday, October 11th at, um, excuse me, in English. So if you're interested in either of those talks, please look out for our newsletter or our posts on Instagram or Facebook, or you can always email us or stop by one of the resource centers if you need help registering for either of those. And now we'll go over the questions. So with the, all the advances that have happened in the last few years or decades, um, are there other technologies or techniques on the horizon that you're looking forward to? Yes, that is actually a great question. So one of the biggest conundrums in metastatic cancer and especially prostate, because as we talked about before, when it spreads, it tends to start centrally and go prolific peripherally. So it involves the pelvis a lot. And pelvic resections and reconstructions are huge surgeries. They can create many problems as they try to solve others. And coming down the, the pipeline, um, a, a clinician from Yale and another one from University of Wisconsin have started developing these protocols where they're managing some of these very challenging cases in the pelvis with what's called percutaneous methods or just through the skin. So just like with those big long nails that we pass down bone, what they are doing is they're using that same live x-ray video camera, making small little incisions around the pelvis, and they're able to pass screws into the pelvis through the skin that have a, a cannula in them, meaning they're hollow. And so then through that hollow screw, we can pass what's called an ablation probe, where basically the probe slides through that hole, gets into the tumor, and then it either freezes or heats up the tumor to kill it. And then what we do is we then pass a balloon through that that we inflate to create space, and then we inject cement through that to reinforce the bone. So without having to do this huge major surgery, yeah, it's multiple steps, but it's all through an incision, you know, this uh, about a half inch wide. And so that to me is a huge game changer for management of a lot of these problems as they get around the hip joint or the sacroiliac joint around the back of the pelvis, because surgery on those sometimes is so big, it's not worth it. And the patients end up very, very miserable living life with these problems in that area. So that to me is probably the most exciting thing. Of course, the most exciting thing for treatment of any cancer really is the advances in medical oncology as well. There seems to be new drugs coming out constantly, and there's now a new type of scan that can detect a certain molecule in some prostate cancers, and then there's a drug that targets that molecule. So we can now detect who might be a good candidate for that one extra drug that may change survival rates and cure rates for a lot of patients that historically we had no answers for as well. So there are, there are a lot of things on the horizon. And honestly, there's a lot of stuff out there I don't even know about. And then I find out about it. It's like that just became available. I didn't even know someone was even working on that. So 
Um, what's nice about cancer is it's always changing. There's a lot of research in it. Prostate cancer tends to be well-funded, so there does get a lot of research on that. And so there's something new almost every year. That's super exciting. And when that technology is available, you'll have to do another presentation for us. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, another question was um, the pictures of the scans that you've showed with the plates and the nails and the implants, they look um, fairly daunting. Are most patients able to uh, live comfortably after that sort of surgery with the help of physical therapy? For sure. So that therein lies the question, right? So are we actually doing a benefit for patient by doing these big surgeries? Because as you can imagine, yeah, it hurts, it's painful, you don't function well, it does take a while. Um, and the answer is, you know, yes, just looking at patients and how they, they recover during surgery, but I'm actually part of a nationwide study right now that's looking at that specifically where we're taking patient-centered outcome scores. So essentially a series of questionnaires that we ask the patient before surgery and after all their surgery and with all these follow-up points to see where's the break-even point? When do they feel like they're doing at least as well as they were before surgery? And what we're finding, you know, the results aren't fully in yet, but just preliminary results look like about six weeks. So it sounds like when you have one of these big problems and it does need a big surgery, once we hit about six weeks after surgery, the surgery was worth it. You're recovered enough to now be doing better than you were before surgery. So in patients with really poor estimated survival or really sick and, and infirm, maybe we back off on surgery, but most patients, believe it or not, do see a good benefit. As we showed in one of those images, we reinforced the bone um, with the plate and screws with bone cement. What studies have found is when you put that cement in there, normally, even with the plate, we need that bone to heal before we can let you do much because the plate is only so strong. When we add that cement, the whole construct and the bone is so much stronger, we can actually let the patient have full activities right off the bat. So surgical pain plays a role in limiting their activities, but basically as soon as it subsides, they can do whatever they want. So when I add cement to those typical constructs, I'm now seeing patients return to almost all of their activities within two to four weeks of surgery. So they're still hurting, but it's not nearly as bad as, as it was you know, previously before we started doing those things. So uh, the answer is yes, it looks daunting. They are big surgeries, but there is a good benefit for patients and they do return to function surprisingly fast once you can reinforce that bone. The other thing that I didn't talk about much is most of the time there's what we call antecedent pain before problems happen. So the patient will be like, yeah, my hip hurts, my hip hurts for months and it's getting worse and everyone's like, yeah, you got arthritis, you know, but then lo and behold, it was a tumor growing the whole time. And so they've already been hurting for a long time and their, their condition and their function have slowly been declining as it is worsened until the bone finally fails and fractures. And so a lot of times when we stabilize that, you know, they wake up already feeling better than they were before surgery. So of course they will have the surgical pain, but because it's so much different and there's now structural support in that bone, they can actually do more than they could before the injury even happens. So uh, good question, but yes, these, these do seem to be, you know, good surgeries and, and well tolerated. That's great to know. Uh, makes, makes it a little less um, scary, I guess you could say. Um, For sure. Got another question here. If a cancer is spread to the spine, what options are available in that situation? Yeah, so very similar. So in the spine, um, there's something called the kyphoplasty, and that is very similar to what we just talked about with some of the pelvis stuff where they use, you know, an x-ray video camera. We go through the skin. We guide a probe into the, um, the vertebral body where the tumor is and basically inflate a balloon to create the space and then inject cement in there to immediately reinforce it. Um, also unique to the spine because the spinal cord is there and all of the nerves and everything, we use a different type of radiation that has a much finer detail and is able to get uh, much closer anatomy with much less collateral damage. And so that's something, you know, you may have heard in the past called gamma knife or um, SBRT, there's all kinds of different names for it, 
um, but it's a very focused type of radiation that tends to be more effective for tumors in the brain and central nervous system. So there are options. The spine is one area where you do need a spine specialist specifically to do that, but here at Good Samaritan, we do have several that do manage metastatic cancer in the bone and the spine. And worst case scenario is when you do have cancer in the spine, the spine does fracture and totally breaks down, has a structural failure, and you can't inject cement in there anymore because you don't have a contained cavity to inject it into. They can do what's called spinal fusion surgery where they go in there and basically bypass that segment uh, with um, uh, a big kind of metal bar that fixes into screws that go into the bone so that it can immediately structurally reinforce the spine and protect the spinal cord. So there are lots of things that can be done there as well. I don't see any other questions, but I'll slowly transition to the next slide in case anyone wants to throw in another question. That is going to conclude our presentation today. Dr. Tedesco, thank you so much for talking to us about this very interesting topic. It's great to hear that there's such advanced technology available for patients and more on the horizon. Uh, we look forward to having you again in October. So thanks so much. Um, and please fill out our survey if you're still on the line. Um, if you missed any part of today's uh, presentation, it is re being recorded and will be available on our YouTube in about a week. So look out for that. Um, or if you have any questions that come to mind at a later time or would like the presentation sent to you directly, feel free to email us at cancerresourcecenter at samhealth.org and we'd be happy to do that. Um, otherwise, I hope everyone has a great day. And again, thank you, Dr. Tedesco. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. and. Thanks to everyone for listening. And yeah, if other questions come up, please feel free to reach out. Awesome. Thanks so much. And everybody have a great day. We'll see you next time.